Hello folks and welcome today to the homestead and this is I'm Howie here and uh, appreciate you joining us today for another porch talk and today uh, oh with all the turmoil and things that seem to be going on and uh, riding and all that I just wanted to talk about being an old time homesteader and before you get any missed ideas we are not an old-time homesteader now i know folks that think we are that know us and think we're old-timey because we raise a garden and i guess you could say we sort of are in a way but we enjoy a lot of modern conveniences that the old homesteaders didn't have and before we get started with today's video very far along if you are not a subscriber, we'd appreciate you helping us if you'd like to help us by simply subscribing. And after you subscribe, a little bell icon will pop up. And if you click on that, you can set your uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel that you have so that you'll be notified when we upload videos. Uh, oftentimes, folks will want to know how they can help us. That's the best way to help our channel here. Um, and also... Uh, commenting and hitting that thumbs up button those also help us uh with our channel and we certainly appreciate you watching and yes we do advertisements um maybe you're not into that that's fine but we do advertisements here um but um the reason we do advertisements is to help offset some of the expenses for our cameras and stuff like that so and it has helped with that and uh always trying to update our technology here at the homestead so we appreciate you watching today and i'll get on in the subject of what i want to talk about and that's being a old time homesteader you know uh, to me an old time homesteader is somebody that would be off grid um perhaps no phones uh, that type of stuff and i was going to tell a little bit about my grandfather who i'm named after and um actually this place here was his place and um actually was bought originally by my great grandfather and they lived in a little town called oil trough arkansas and that's where my grandfather was born and his dad and mom they brought him here at oklahoma in a covered wagon up around the telequaw area and you may be familiar with telequaw oklahoma but uh, where the red fern grows, that supposedly in the book was uh, the boy goes to Tahlequah to get his uh, little dogs there. And not very far from here in a little town called Vian, about eight miles from here, maybe ten miles, um, there's a train depot there where they actually filmed the movie Where the Red Fern Grows, uh, the uh, train depot where he goes and gets the uh, uh, little puppies at is... Uh, red bone hounds why he goes there to get him and that uh, i'm not sure right now i was thinking this morning is that place still there the train depot it was as i was growing up but uh they come here and film that uh for part of their movie instead of they say it's telequa but it's actually vian oklahoma and that was kind of a historical landmark here in fact used to um every one of the towns through here had a little train depot and you could hop on a train if you wanted to and that's long since been gone but anyway my grandfather he didn't bring it right on a train they rode on a covered wagon from oil trough arkansas which is near the jonesboro arkansas area and uh, they come to uh, telequaw and settled there uh, bought a piece of ground, built an old house. When I was a kid, my dad would take us up there and show us the old home. There was nobody living there then, but the old place, it was pretty primitive. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> and most people would, would not have wanted to live there based on today's standards. But anyway, they come all the way here, and my grandpa used to tell a story that uh, when they come here to Oklahoma, that they had a hound dog that followed them all the way from Old Trough, Arkansas, to, to up near Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And uh, anyway, when they uh, after they were here for a few days, the old dog just come up missing. And his dad told him, said, well, coyotes probably ate him or no telling what happened 
to him and just he's gone so uh it took a few weeks and they got a letter from their family over there in arkansas that told them that the uh, dog had come home and that old dog had remembered the way back and went that whole journey back home uh, during that time of people moving here i know another family here that uh, they come here to this area from Arkansas as well over around a place called Falling Water, Arkansas. And there's a big holiness church camp meeting goes on there every year, has for many years, if you've ever heard of that area. But it's on Highway 7 between Russellville, Arkansas and uh, Harrison. And uh, you have to turn off there. You have to be looking for the place to find it. But there's hundreds of people that come there every year for this big uh, camp meeting they have down there in that valley. But they call it Falling Water. And there's an old church there. Um, they built a newer church there. Uh, you would think there was nothing out there in that area. But uh, it is something else to see. But anyway, there was a family from that area that came here. That's kind of how we ended up getting in to know these people and everything but they had come here during that time as well and when they got here to this p part of oklahoma the economy was so poor over there in arkansas i guess they thought it would be better here in oklahoma and there was a lot of folks that were actually heading to california and they stopped in here and was able to buy land and stuff very cheap and get started because a lot of the people had went broke and was heading to California to gonna to try to get rich out there. So, uh, or better off themselves out there. But anyway, these folks from Arkansas had come and uh, they, one of their family members uh, developed a respiratory ailment and they went back to Fallen Water, Arkansas. But there's some of them that stayed and uh, they're still around their family name is and their remnants of that bunch that come here but they went back to fallen water and uh, so most of them i guess all of them now have died off uh, one of the ones that i knew a preacher man he has passed away but it's kind of an interesting story but said when they went back they pulled their wagons with oxen and uh, they said that they had to wrap the oxen's feet with uh cloth because the journey was so hard getting back home and I, so i don't know you'd think but they came here they stayed two or three years and went back well you would think the oxen would have been healed up then for some reason they had a worse problem getting back to arkansas than they did coming here and uh, you know nowadays we don't ever see oxen around here or anything like that but they had pulled their wagons with oxen and most of them had headed back and then some of them came back here and settled uh, the younger ones had heard about this area where we live and some of them settled just right here where our neighbors uh, and they were from that area but they uh, weren't with the original bunch but they had heard about this area and people really thought it was a neat place to live so they had come here but anyway my get back to my grandfather's uh, situation um Later on, my great-grandfather, he come down here and bought this piece of property here. And originally it was like, uh, I believe 50 acres was the original piece of property. And then my grandfather bought 10 more uh, when he got it. But his dad really bought it for, for him. My great-grandfather bought it for my grandpa and uh, grandma to help them get started in life. And he felt like owning land was very, very important. And uh, he tried to get my dad to buy property. At that time when my dad graduated high school, uh, during that time, my dad could have bought this land around here for nothing. Um, you know, for $40 an acre, stuff like that, where now uh, you're looking at $2,500 to $3,000 an acre for the land around here. And I know that's cheap compared to some parts of the country. But, uh, but my dad instead bought a new car and he got a loan on it. And uh, his grandpa told him, he said, I'll... Uh, I'll co-sign for you. I'll do whatever. I'll help you buy this land, buy up land, and uh, build you a cattle herd and uh, do that. And my dad looks back now and wished he would have. Of course, you know, in life, you always got a, a coulda, shoulda, wouldas. But dad said there was land everywhere, and it was cheap. Didn't think it was worth nothing, would ever be worth nothing. But my great-grandfather seen the value in it and knew it would be worth something one of these days. Had my dad bought that land, he could be selling it right now and 
as a great, uh, it would have been a great investment. He'd have made money off of it. He could have bought this place across the road here for, I think it's $700 for the entire place. Uh, it's 40 or 50 acres over there, whatever that comes out to be is $700, $750. Instead, my dad goes and buys a car for like $1,200. And, uh, you know, he just didn't think it was worth it. Bought a new car, I believe it was brand new at that, a Mustang. So, you know, um, but getting back to my grandfather, when they come here, if you can imagine coming here and the stories about Indians, they didn't have television and stuff, but they had radios. And my grandfather was a big newspaper guy, and he read the newspaper clear up till his death. That was a daily thing. They took out the no local newspaper, and they he read it every day, and that's where he kept up on his news at. They didn't watch much television at all. They had a television, but it was very, very rare for them to watch it. He liked those country and western shows, and on Saturday afternoons, if you went over there, in the hot summertime, they would have their water cooler going uh, to cool them off. Some call those swamp coolers. We call them water coolers here, but a water cooler really is the thing you get to go up to to get a cold drink of water. And most people around there right here call them water coolers or water fountains, but we call them water coolers, these big swamp coolers that would sit in your window around here and you'd put water in them or some would put a block of ice in them and they'd put out cold air. Well, when it was really hot weather, they would watch um, these evening uh, shows uh, that come on on Saturdays and that was a usual routine. But for their news, he liked to read the newspaper and he loved to read the funny stories in there. But the reason was back when they came here, that was your source of news. And they listened to the radio back in the day, but Grandpa said it was uh, like you had to have a battery to listen to the radio or some means to charge up the battery. So they would save up money and every once in a while buy a battery so they could listen to the radio when these uh, like Grand Ole Opry and some of that came on and that was a big treat so when he got old his big treat was to actually watch those shows on television and uh, his news come from the newspaper and you know we have CNN Fox in CBC whatever all the uh, channels are nowadays and we have it at the, our fingertips you know you can watch it on your phone if you want to but if you can imagine having to read a newspaper no electricity no running water the water the running water was your kids going and getting it my grandfather was the only child of his family also for some reason my grandmother was never able to have more children and uh but she just accepted that as god's will but back in the day they would have uh, a dozen uh children or more and uh you know, most families around here were big uh, families. They they needed them to be able to uh, work the land and the farm and stuff. Now, my grandfather, when he married, why uh, he did have a, a dozen children. My mom, uh, my biological mom on her side of the family, they had a dozen also. So they were big families. But for my grandfather to be the only one was a little bit uh, odd at the time. But uh, they raised him and taught him to work and they canned and one thing back in the day uh, I wanted to explain on this because of being homesteaders and we do this ourselves now is you had to prepare during the summer months you had to prepare for winter and winters were colder and they were harder on folks back in the day than they are now. Uh, you had to put back your fuel supply for your wood stove, most cooked with wood. Uh, they heated their home with wood. So before it got very cold, you had to have your wood supply back. And during the spring, you were dependent on a good garden. Every place around here, the old home places around this part of where we live at, all of them. There's one right here at my aunt's, one over here where my gr grandfather ended up moving to after my grandma died, up here where my dad was raised at the original old home place. Uh, my mo grandma on my mom's side, as many as I can think of, all had cellars. And they weren't made 
for meant to be for the tornadoes. We had tornadoes, but that wasn't the main purpose. They were called them root cellars, and the uh, reason for that was to keep your stuff cool. You could put them down in uh, the the, uh, the ones that around here. They were all hand dug, and uh, they're not used today. Most people have had storm shelters brought in. That's concrete ones that are put in, and they don't use those for. Uh, uh, anything anymore most of them they're even filling them in with dirt bulldozing them in but they were kind of crude structures but the first thing you did when you started a homestead was you got you a root cellar going and like I say it wasn't for the tornadoes and I'll explain the reason for that was when I was a boy they we had the alert system that would alert you for tornadoes when we would hear maybe on the news or something talk several miles away of tornadoes. That's when we went ahead and went to shelters. And it's not like now they'll give this radar update and they'll say it's going to be at your place in 20 minutes, 30 minutes. We would just know that it was real stormy back towards the west. And we would go up to our neighbor's house and they had a home they had built. They, they had homesteaded here, but they had built this home that was supposed to be fireproof earthquake proof and tornado proof and it was all rock and concrete the inside outside everything and it actually stayed pretty cool the way it was built they did have air conditioning in it but they had moved here settled on this and used the rocks there on the land to build this house with these big thick walls and everything and he had gotten the idea from california and they had actually had a house fire once, so he wanted to build a home that would be tornado proof and everything. So we would, all the neighbors here would run up to their house if it looked like it was going to be bad weather. And we just sat around and visited. A lot of times nothing ever come about it. But if you waited at home until they gave the tornado warning, sometimes a rough storm would come through and you'd see the low hanging uh, funnel clouds and stuff. It, you know, maybe not touch down or anything like that. But when you come back home here, and everything was cleared off in the storms. You could see them back to the east, the back side of the storms. Well, the weather alert would start going off on the television. And say, name in our town is take shelter immediately. There was a tornado. Well, it was too late then. The tornado had already been by 10 or 15 minutes later. So the weather system didn't work like it does today. Today, we have a little box that's by the bed and it alerts us of uh, storms. And so when they're coming this way, we start getting warnings ahead of time. We start getting prepared. And usually, now that doesn't isn't a fail safe because sometimes so we've had tornadoes here that they never even gave a warning at all even in the modern times that we are in uh, you know they didn't now maybe after the tornado had already done damage here and went on now we've been blessed here that we've not had our actual homes and stuff destroyed but we have had damage very close here of storms and we've seen the backside I have a video of a storm that come through in the backside of the big funnel cloud that was here and later on when it went on a few miles from here it did touch down and cause damage but the straighty holes or what we call them now but the root cellars were made to preserve your vegetables you could put uh, potatoes uh, things like that down in them uh, stuff that you wanted to last a while um, one thing that my uh, uh, most homesteaders another thing besides building a root cellar water right off is you had to have a water source and so most built near a water source a lot of folks uh, around here along the rivers and the creeks uh, my grandfather settled along this creek here and most of the year you've got running water on the creek but you also have um uh, spring there and they built a spring house the old spring is still there still works the house is falling down but they built a spring house and they would uh, before they had electric here they would walk down and put stuff in this concrete vat thing that was made there in the spring house and water would run into that and you would drop your jugs of milk and stuff like that down in there they also had an ice box and so they would uh buy a block of ice and put in the ice box and uh when my grandfather got this place 
they said it's one day a week that a man come through on a horse, and that man ended up, his son ended up marrying one of my aunts in a long about story, but the guy would come around with a horse and buggy and had ice in there, and you could buy a block of ice. Down here at town when I was a boy, there was a um, store that had a white building sitting out in front, and it was an ice house, and if you wanted a block of ice, they had these big scissor things that would grab a hold of it and they would carry it out and when we went to like put ice in an ice cooler we would buy a block of ice and put in there because it would last longer it took up a lot of room and our first camper we had actually had an ice box in it it wasn't uh, that my dad had an overhead camper and in that camper you had a refrigerator that you put a block of ice in if you can imagine <laughs> that uh, but anyway uh, around here without electric and without refrigeration and at times i guess they weren't able to buy the ice maybe they didn't have the money so they took stuff down to the spring house and kept things in there but you mostly had to preserve your foods either by canning or salting the pork down that type of stuff so they didn't eat a lot of beef when they wanted chicken they just went out and killed a fresh chicken dad said in the springtime his mama they'd have chickens that were really too young to butcher and that dad said that his mom would say uh, you know before the fo coyotes or foxes catch them young roosters there said won't you go ahead and kill a couple of them and we'll eat them so he would go out and said his mama never could stand to kill an animal so my dad or grandpa or one of the other brothers would have to go and and uh, kill the chickens that she would clean them but she didn't have the heart said she was very soft and kind-hearted woman and she couldn't kill them there but anyway they he said they would have fried chicken and it was really too young at that time but he said they lived off that and said in a week or so later you know they were growing bigger you'd go out and get another couple and have fried chicken and that's what they did because they had no way to refrigerate it once you uh you killed it it was over and uh, they lived off of pork so a modern or, or old time homesteaders you know our modern homesteaders we got refrigerators and freezer stuff and actually it, there's people alive that go to our church that were born around this area when they did not have electricity. And uh, I did a repair years ago on a freezer or tried to do a repair for a man. And I, some of his children are still living around here. But he told me that this freezer, the hinges wore out. And I wasn't able to get hinges for it. The doors and walls were like extremely thick and there was nobody made any type hinges that would fit that thing. So uh, I told him there wasn't anything I could do to get it back into shape like he wanted. Well, he told me I could just have it if I wanted. He said, that thing is pretty old, getting old. And he said, that was what we bought when we got electricity. He said, they wired through uh, power lines and they ran a line over to their home and they put one plug in in the home so that they could have a freezer, not a refrigerator, but a freezer and they continued with an ice box for a very long time sometime after that until they got a refrigerator um you know it's just unbelievable you know if you think about going back to that today uh it would be very very strange but you know we call ourselves homesteaders but we're modern homesteaders we have phones I have air conditioning. You know, it's hard to imagine without even air conditioning. But there was a time here when folks didn't even have swamp coolers, nothing. They just had the windows. My dad said that when he was a boy over here, they had no fans, no anything like that. And when it was hot in the summer, everybody hung around outside. Their place had big shade trees. They sat out in the yard as the sun moved. You moved your chairs around if it was like a holiday, something like that. But people stayed outside and they didn't notice the heat so bad. They actually slept out in the front yard when it was hot and they would drag the mattresses off the beds and uh, um, and there's a story behind all that, but they would drag them outside in the lawn, in the yard, and he said if a thunderstorm come up in the night, you had to hurry and grab everything and run back in the house, and that some would sleep on the porch and stuff, and just things that, uh, it's hard to imagine that time, but people were happy, 
and they survived, but they had to get prepared through the spring and summer for winter. And one thing they did is they went to the store once a month around here. And different ones have told stories about going to town, and town from right here is not all that far, maybe five miles to town, something like that. Um, but that that was a journey, and it was something very fun to do on a, in a wagon is to go to town. And uh, that uh, there's a church that we go to now, and a lot of people went there on foot. They walked to church. They didn't worry about horses, and they, my aunts and stuff tell me they had a trail uh, from our property here that went over the mountain through other people's places, but there were trails, and people would travel those trails to, to church or to town, uh, and you didn't even have to worry about going on the main roads if you was walking, or I guess you could take horses and went through there too. And my dad, he had a, a horse, and I guess all of his different siblings and stuff had horses, and you just hop on your horse and take off like you see in these old westerns and stuff and there's some old men around here was asking me if i ever remembered that one old horse my dad had when i was born and his name was spot and uh, that there's just no spotted horse but uh, i don't remember it doing any kind of tricks but the guys around here said my dad used to do uh when he was in high school, would do tricks off of this horse. And uh, like I say, he never, <laughs> I don't remember anything like that. And when I got on up a little older, probably seven, eight year old, my dad sold his horse and he actually had me a horse too and we sold them out. But uh, so that part of it, I don't, re I remember the horse though, it being a black and white spotted horse and dad called him spot but you know people would just hop on their horses and take off and go wherever or they walked around here and to think that you know you know now we gotta who would dare think about walking four or five miles to town there's a little lady in our church that she's in her 90s and uh, she's a little indian woman and she said they was raised up here on the mountain and it's probably Oh, six or seven miles to town, if I don't know for sure, but somewhere in that neighborhood. But she said they would go once a month and they would go on a Friday to town. And she said when they did, it was a big deal. So they would be so excited as children to go to town. You know, we just take it for granted today. But she said it would take all day long by the time they rode their horse and buggy and went to town. And she said uh, by the time they got back home, the sun would be going down and they had it timed where they could get back. But she said, I remember going and she said it was so much fun and such a neat experience. And I love to hear folks tell these old stories and reminisce about that time in their lives. And uh, But uh, I think today of us and, uh, and what I feel like as a modern homesteader, that some of the things like preserving food and storing food or if you can't grow your own garden, maybe you don't have a place, but putting back enough food to last you through the winter. If you couldn't go to town, one thing that my grandfather used to talk about was that it would get so cold here in the winter, he did a lot of construction work when it was available. Helped build dams and roads and bridges. They used to have some old film, the old roll film of him building one of these bridges down here. And he would walk those beams just, you know, they used to do them big steel beam structures where Grandpa could just walk that stuff and it was showing him, he kind of showing out, but uh, it's something he didn't fall off there and get killed. They didn't have safety straps or nothing like that to put on. If they did, he just, I'd never seen it in any of the videos. They probably told him to and my Grandpa probably just didn't and, and no telling, but anyway, uh, He's a little man and he'd just go everywhere. And I thought he guess I think he thought he was invincible even when he was an old man. I think he thought he was invincible. Uh, fella, and I thought he was too, even though he looked like Popeye the Sailor Man, bald head and everything. But anyway, uh, he uh, uh, said in the winter, there was no work. And uh, these construction jobs would shut down because it would get too cold. The ground would freeze so hard you couldn't dig in the ground and uh, you'd lost your means of income. So you had to have stuff put back to survive um, the winter time. And so during the summer, not only that, you had to put back hay for your livestock. 
uh, they would grow corn and put it in a barn and leave it in the, on the husk and everything, field corn, and they would uh, uh, have uh, uh, corn cribs built in the barn. And when they come in the middle of the barn, they would throw the corn up over the walls of that and leave it in the husk and whenever they got ready to use it they would just pull that back if they wanted it off the cob they had a grinder thing that would grind it but said a lot of times they fed the corn on the cob the whole thing to the animals they'd also take that dried corn and they would use it to make hominy and stuff like that or if they needed cornmeal they would take it off the cob then they had a grinder they would grind up uh, cornmeal but they would put back enough stuff like that to uh, take care of their uh, livestock through the winter time. So you had to be prepared, uh, you know, for about a six month period because, you know, in the spring, as soon as it turns warm, you're not getting produce again. You had to have enough food to survive. In the fall, in uh, around the first of November, Grandpa said they always butchered hogs. There was a certain weekend, and I can't recall what it was, but he's either the first or second week weekend of November. That's when they butchered hogs. And he said that if there's bad weather, they done it the next weekend. But other people around here had another weekend that they'd done, and that you would go help them out. So for a month of weekends there, you know, starting sometime in October through five or six weeks there, every Saturday you would go to someone else's homestead and you would help butcher hogs there. And there would be a bunch of people show up, and Grandpa said the women would uh, um, go and... Um, do uh, the inside work and they would cook a big lunch and said the men would stay outside and scald and scrape the hogs and cut them up bring the meat in and the women would uh, cut it up and get it prepared and uh, pack it down in salt and put some in the smokehouse all the different things they'd do with it they would grind up the trimmings and make sausage and they would fry that and then put it in quart jars uh, large mouth jars and put some grease over the top of it and grandpa said they would turn it up, upside down and that when you ate that sausage the jar upside down when you got ready for sausage all you did was lay it in a skillet and heat it up it was already cooked and said it was just as good as if you just freshly cooked it but they couldn't keep anything because of the refrigeration he also said one of the things that was really neat was the women all got together and they cooked a big dinner and so uh, uh, you know it's a lot of work you figure cleaning all them hogs taking care of that and the women working and cooking uh, you know the way they had to do was a big undertaking but he said then the next weekend you would go over here to someone else's homestead and you would help them kill hogs as well uh, my grandfather after his daddy had given him this place uh, as a marriage gift, well, they bought 10 more acres joining them up here on the hillside, and they called it the hog pasture. And they put what most people would call field fence around it, but most of that old fence, there's still some. I had to repair fence up the other day, and I was thinking of that old fence. Uh, some of it is, is still there, and I was like, that's fence that my grandfather and great-grandfather put up on this place to keep their hogs in. But they had 10-acre pasture, that they called the hog pasture. And that's all they did on that was raise uh, uh, pigs on that. And uh, it has a pond and um, they would eat up in the woods, has a lot of trees, they'd eat acorns and stuff. It don't have as many trees now as it did back when my dad was a boy. We've allowed people to come in there and cut wood and clean it off and it's made excellent uh, cow pasture. But uh, you know, we hear of people calling it silva pastures now and stuff where they use the woods and some will turn their hogs in there and stuff well that's what basically they were doing here before uh we ever even knew of a silver <laughs> pasture they were already doing that here and it and it worked but um they had their own milk cows so during the winter time my dad and his family, his grandfather, he said they ate really well. They didn't know any better, but they would eat very, very well. And if you couldn't go to the store and buy things because you didn't have the money or maybe the weather wasn't permitting, 
uh, you didn't have to worry about it. It also got colder back in the day. And uh, if you can imagine, I, I like these warmer summers we, or winters we're having. Not the warmer summers, but I like the warmer winters we're having. But if you can imagine uh, being a whole lot colder and you weren't hooked up to propane or natural gas and you had to have all your wood carried in. And these old houses like where my dad was that didn't have any insulation. I mean, they just wasn't much to the walls. Uh, there's an old house uh, right across the road from us over here, and uh, the inside walls were nothing. It had uh, like newspaper glued up on the walls to seal it off. There's no insulation. The inside part of the walls, you can see the tuba four studs on the walls or tuba sixes. They look like they were really hand cut. Sure enough, tuba fours. Uh, on the walls, the old place is still standing by the way, and there's lots of people around here that lived there. The guy who owned it originally had built another home somewhere and he rented that out to people. And uh, people, several families were, were lived there at different times in their lives and rented that old house and it's still there today. A man in our church that's a whole lot older than me, he uh, was telling me that he lived in that house at one time and he said he didn't know but what the weeds was all that's holding it up now but when you go in it it's uh, amazing how uh, people could live in such a structure like that but if you figure the winter times my grandpa said that it would get so cold here down here at the river before they built the bridges they had a ferry there's a place here in our town called summer's ferry and it was a, like a big barge thing and they would pull across on a rope it was connected to and would take you across to the other side of the river. And uh, Grandpa said in the winter time, the river would freeze over and that they couldn't move that thing across. The ferry would just have to sit there. So you would go over there to working or doing something and he said, you just ride your horse. And he said, they've even pulled covered wagons across that the Arkansas River. Now, the Arkansas River now is wider than it used to be because of the lock and dam system. They have these reservoirs that they've dammed up to raise the water level so that the tugboats can travel up and down the system. But if you imagine it getting cold enough that the whole thing, I, I have remembered ice in my time being froze over that going across the bridge and the river being froze over almost all the way across it but never thick enough that you could have driven a vehicle or rode a horse or anything across it but and maybe it has and i just didn't what, see it at the time but my grandfather said in the winter that's how you got across and uh, you didn't have to pay no fee because you could just go across it on the ice they later built a bridge a two-lane uh well really was more like a one lane bridge but it started out as two lane but as vehicles got bigger and trucks they put lights on both sides where you had to uh, cross one vehicle at a time and uh, before they did that dad said it'd be real scary he said you'd meet a big truck coming across there and using a little car and there was a lot of accidents happened then they built the bridge that's there now in the 70s it's a big uh, humped uh, structure thing and they've done away with the the old bridge, but to imagine a time when things were, and even today, I think it would be a wise thing to prepare for the winter time. And we do that here at our homestead. We prepare for the winter. We put back food, not to say we don't go to the grocery store, nothing like that, but we'll have meat put back. We'll have, uh, now if we lost electricity, we would be scrambling here. For a little while, I could run the freezers on generators, stuff like that, but it, we would have be scrambling because we don't salt down our pork and things like that like they did in the old days. Uh, I am uh, going to start back raising hogs. I used to raise pigs, and I'm going to get back into it, and I'm going to practice smoking and curing. Uh, some bacons and hams and stuff that wouldn't have to be refrigerated and uh, just to know that skill and to get into that like my grandfather and them used to do my grandpa used to do that and I watched him do it but I never actually uh, done it and even when he had refrigeration they would butcher a hog and he loved still yet to salt cure and smoke and stuff the uh, 
hams and bacons and whatnot, and that was still a thrill to him. And he would go out there to an old shed he had where he actually where he stored his feed, and on the shelves there would be a slab of ham or bacon or whatever, and he'd go out and get it and cut some off. And, and I remember him doing that as a boy. But, you know, even though he had electricity, he kept his skills up. He had a blacksmith shop my grandpa did that was an old timey one like you see on gun smoke and stuff. It's had a bellows thing that you pumped with your foot and it heated up this big deal here. And after I, I moved off from here, my grandpa died about a year later and uh, his widow, my step grandmother, her family come in and they just kind of scattered all my grandpa's stuff off. And uh, I don't know where it all went to. I think uh, they sold some whatever. But a man that is into history and antique stuff, uh, when I moved back here 12 years ago, uh, he told me, he said, uh, did your grandpa ever have a blacksmith shop? And I said, yes, he did. And he said, well, I have this little piece here that is from a blacksmith's shop and he said i was wondering if you would want it he said i found it there in the road in front of your grandpa's house he said we were driving around one day and i seen that he said it's after your grandpa had passed away and he said i've kept it all this time and so i said yeah i want but what i said yes i'd like to have it if he wanted to get rid of it. if not finders keepers it was his but he said well you can have it being your grandpa so i've got it. it's a little wedge looking thing in a square and they would heat up metal and they'd take this and hit it with a hammer and knock a square hole into the metal from what i understand and i cannot think of what the name of this thing was but if you think of not having an electric welder and uh, stuff like that it's just uh, unbelievable but grandpa would say i'm going to weld something and he never had a welder he'd just go in there and get things heated up and going and in no time he had it fixed uh, the the whatever that was that he had needed done he'd have it done but he didn't have an arc welder you know i've got a electric arc welder welder even got a diesel one that i can power up boy i can zip out the welding real quick and i wouldn't know how to to go about doing it without electricity but folks knew how to survive and i think in the time we're living we need to know how to survive i think things are going to get worse and worse the bible tells us things are going to get worse and they have gotten worse in the last just my lifetime in 50 years from the time I started and can remember think people have gotten worse I, we have gotten better modernized but we have gotten worse and so I just say to everybody uh, I'm preparing for the worst and hoping for the best I actually enjoy this too if you enjoy a homesteading lifestyle I think we'd be better if we got off of some of the modern things and got back to a more simpler life in fact we got rid of we had this uh, satellite TV you know we got rid of that because um, I just don't need that stuff we don't have time for it if you're homesteading and I'm happier I believe for it not just from that but other things but I think uh, the Amish people, <clears throat> they seem to be pretty happy and they have very little of anything and uh, of modern conveniences anyway, and they seem to be pretty happy and satisfied. And I know with the Lord, we can, whatever state we're in, we can, whatever situation we're in, that if we've got God on our side, He can bless us. But here we enjoy our lifestyle. We love the simpler lifestyle. In fact, I continue to try to get away from the more modern and get more back to what I call more simpler lifestyle. Also, simpler lifestyle, believe it or not, is actually cheaper. It's cheaper to operate in a simpler lifestyle. Well, I've rambled on today long enough, but just a little bit about my grandfather. I told about my grandma on my um, mom's side uh, uh, a week or so ago and now I just want to tell about uh, homesteading and some call themselves a homesteader and there's all different calibers of that and I don't care it doesn't matter to me some will say that we're not homesteaders because we're not off-grid uh, you know that's fine you can call me what you want to we just call ourselves homesteaders but I would say we're more of what you call a modern homesteader but I think knowing the old ways and the old skills and being prepared for winter time where you could survive a cold, hard, long winter with very little. This year, we kind of had a scare of our lives with this uh, COVID thing and the stores closing down and uh, supplies being limited and still our supplies are limited. And so uh, being prepared, we were prepared. We didn't panic 
because of toilet paper. We weren't going down and uh, having a fight at the crowd. In fact, we said, we're staying home here until this kind of settles. We'll just stay home. And we did, and we enjoyed it, and we had a good time. And we didn't want for anything. We were fine. Uh, the Lord was with us. One of the worst things we had was not going to church. We missed not being able to go see our friends at church. Now we're back to doing that. But uh, we, we made it. And you can make it if you'll prepare and be ready. And I will assure you, based upon the Bible, if you don't believe me, read your Bible, Things are going to get worse. You might as well give in and get prepared. I know some's commented they don't believe the Holy Bible that we do, but they do think things are getting worse. <laughs> hey, get prepared. Hey, God bless you. We appreciate you watching today. We'll see you next week here for more Porch Talk. And me and Stacy, we're looking forward to. And yes, Stacy and Josie is the same thing. I call her Josie as a nickname because that's her middle name. But I uh, call her Josie a lot and she likes that. But uh, anyway, uh, we're planning on doing some more videos. We've just been so busy. And she's planning on doing some Canon videos and different things like that. So I hope you enjoy uh, those. And we're working on uh, more uh, uh, content here on our channel. And uh, but anyway, I'm trying to make sure I do a porch talk each week, but uh, we're working on it. So pray for us that we'll be able to get it all done and it'll all work out right. And uh, once again, God bless you. We're gone.